All right. Well, good morning, Rotary District 7770. Welcome to Conversations with Rotary Action People for Monday, November 30th. We've made it to the end of November. Tomorrow is December. Man, I'm telling you, this year has flown by. My name is Donald Hovis, your CRAP host, and I'm from the Chicora Rotary Club in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. We're pleased to be joined by two fellow District 7770 Rotarians from the Five Points Rotary Club, L.E. Spradlin, and from the Columbia Capital Club, Bob Davis. We look forward to your presentation in just a few minutes. Gentlemen, just some quick announcements, and we'll get to your presentation. Introducing your CRAP team, our public image chair from the Five Points Rotary Club in Columbia, the wonderful Mary Gask. Good morning, Mary. I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, we've got a very informative presentation today by these two gentlemen. So we're going to keep the announcements very short and brief. But uh, how about go to the chat box and introduce yourself with your name and your Rotary Club. Now, real quick, as I introduce our speakers here. And if you have a question during today's <coughs> program, please post it in the chat box, folks, and I will uh, ask those questions of our speakers at the end. And I do want you guys to hang on as long as you can today. I do have a special announcement I want to save for the end, and it's going to be our closing announcement today, and I think you guys will all appreciate what that announcement will be. So, all right, Captain Robert E. Bob Davis. He retired in 2002 after thir serving 30 years in the United States Navy. Um, let's see here, Ellie. Uh, he's been in, in Rotary since 1974. Uh, he served in the Navy Reserve for 22 years. So Ellie and Bob, good morning and welcome to CRAP. Thanks for being here with us. Good morning. Bob, you're well, Hello, fellow Rotarian. Ellie and I thought we'd begin with a little history of submarines in the service of the United States of America. Basically, that story starts back in 1775, when with the encouragement of George Washington, a guy named David Bushnell built the turtle. The turtle looked like an egg standing on its end. It had a one-man crew. She was designed to creep up on a submerged enemy ship, on a, creep up submerged on an enemy ship, leave a time bomb attached to the hull, and withdraw to safety before the explosion. Three attempts were made, including one on Admiral Lord Howe's flagship, the Eagle. None of the attacks succeeded, even though they failed, George Washington said, and I quote, I thought it was an effort of genius. The next step was in 1800, Robert Fulton designed another hand-propelled submarine. The United States had no interest in it, and Fulton offered it to France. Napoleon liked it, built a test model named Nautilus, how about that? Which did successfully sink a hull placed at Fulton's disposal. Napoleon then declared it dishonorable, and in truth, Napoleon just wanted to build a thing and not pay for it, uh, not pay Fulton for it. Uh, Fulton got sense of that, headed to England, he offered it to the British, William Pitt, the Prime Minister, loved it, uh, but the uh, Admiralty rejected it. Fulton packed his bags, went back to America, and began the development of the first steamship, Claremont. The first submarine combatant to successfully sink an enemy warship was, of course, the H.L. Hunley. It was, the Hunley was a privately funded enterprise. It was not a commissioned warship, as was the case with the famous raider, the CSS Alabama. The Hunley sank the Housatonic off of Charleston in February, on February 17, 1864. The Hunley and its crew were lost in the attack. In the late 1800s, a gentleman by the name of John Holland began designing and building submarines. On October 12, 1900, the USS Holland, designated submarine hull number one, was commissioned. Seven more Holland-class boats were built. The Hollands had one 
torpedo tube. Submarine design and development continues until the present day and well into the foreseeable future. Along the way, there have been multiple tragedies. The three crews of the ill-fated Hunley led the way. On this next chart, you can see that in peacetime, we've lost 11 conventional submarines and two nuclear submarines, again, lost in peacetime. And the, the loss of the nuclear submarines, in particular, are stories unto themselves. To, by the 1960s and the 1970s, there were two types of submarines in the Navy fleet. The first was a fleet ballistic missile submarine, had intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, that could be launched, and they had nuclear warheads, and then multiple uh, integrated uh, reentry uh, re vehicles for multiple targets. The boats had two crews. They would uh, rotate, alternate service, serving 70 days on a patrol. The other type of submarine was the fast attack submarine. It had one crew. Its task was essentially to sink enemy vessels and to conduct intelligence gathering operations. That's the type of ship I served on and we'll discuss shortly. Now, I'll turn it over to Ellie for some uh, info on our submarine, submarine fleet in World War II. Ellie? Thank you, Bob, and good morning, Rotarians. And as, as you saw in the previous slide that submarine duty hit in the peacetime was uh, hazardous, but here's a take a look at a little bit what it might have been a little bit like in, the, in wartime. In the Second World War, Germany started the 39, started with 57 submarines and added an unbelievable 1,162 new submarines during the war. And of that total, 785 were destroyed and by far the bulk of those were sunk at sea by various aircraft and Navy ships and what have you. The Japanese started the war with 63 submarines and that was, by the way, back on the Germans, that was 64% casualty of the submarines. I don't have a personnel number, but that's how much, what percentage of their fleet was destroyed. The Japanese started with 63, added 111, and 128 of those were destroyed for a 74% casualty rate. Japanese had a different philosophy on the use of submarines that we'll catch at a little bit later on. Then, then you take a look at the U.S. The U.S. had 52 submarines lost in, uh, in the World War II. And of those, that I think you can see the cursor, but the 33 and the 8 gives you a total of 41 that, uh, that we lost to uh, enemy uh, operations and then 11 others. But, and five of those were, unfortunately, to friendly fire and to defective torpedoes that came around and sank our own ships after they were sunk. And there's 375 officers and 3,131 sailors lost uh, uh, to uh, the war. That's a 22% fatality ratio, which is probably about as high as, what well, is as high as any branch of service, but not necessarily particular divisions for, for Army and the Marines. But let's, what, what did they do? You know, the, this is the ton, tonnage uh, sunk. Remember back, Germany started with just 57 submarines and they grew to well over a thousand, but they sank 14,300,000 tons of shipping and that's 2,840 vessels. And, and uh, if you remember history, they back basically were starving uh, Great Britain, uh, but with all the, uh, the damage and the shipping that they were taking place. The Japanese sank 907,000 tons, and their focus was on uh, battle against warships, basically. And they also had some, a couple of specialty submarines that they used to transport personnel and supplies to some of their remote island uh, uh, places where they had captured it. Uh, the U.S. sank 1,079 for 4.6 million tons, and the British 493 for 1.5 million tons, and so. So we had a significant difference, although uh, in the end, it was the U.S. and Great Britain, as you know, that came out. So to turn a little bit to submarine stories, and uh, I'm going, this is a, a picture of the USS Harder, which is the one I was on. But the story I wanted to relate to you is uh, uh, some submarine operations. Uh, and I have a, a personal remote connection to this uh, uh, World War II uh, USS Barb uh, 
story I have, and that is that the barb was, in addition to being a great submarine for normal submarine duties, it sank a 16-car Japanese train. And it, it seems uh, late in the war when the Japanese target opportunities were few, the barb sitting outside a Japanese harbor, uh, the Kara, Karafuto Prefecture, it's actually it was in China, was waiting for some shipping to show up that they could sink. And they observed a regular nighttime train of war supplies passing along the shoreline. The chief of the boat, a, a, who was a veteran of 12 war patrols, unbelievable 12 war patrols, uh, uh, came up with the idea of why don't we see if we can't uh, put a, shore, a party ashore and sink that uh, train. And so they developed a plan, a plan and one officer, one officer and seven sailors. So they had to come in close to the shore and get them ashore by rubber boats and all this kind of stuff. And so they were dinner on a moonless, a moonless night. And uh, the, the CO uh, selected folks to go on it and he made sure they had, he said he ordered some Boy Scouts on there in case the submarine, for obvious reasons, had to get out of the, out of the way and leave the guys on the shore. That they might be able to wander up the Chinese coastland, uh, to, uh, up to uh, uh, Russian territory, and and, and, and escape. Anyway, that's what it was. Anyway, they went went ashore with a what a, a what they call a land torpedo. It was actually an explosive device that the submarines all had on board, which the submarines used in case they had to sink the ship themselves to keep it from being captured. And they rigged up detonators for it. And I, I think it was really kind of interesting uh, uh, how they did this. Uh, uh, they, some of you may have done this. I did back in the 1950s. Uh, when you take uh, small coins or little rocks or something like that, you'd put them on a railroad track when the would come by and you go up and see if you couldn't find the coins. They'd smash the rocks to smithereens, but find the coins all flattened out. It was always interesting to do. Well, they used that concept with the detonator. And so they had a pressure detonator that they was there, and when the train came along, it would run over it and ignite it and, and get the train. And, and everything was going just fine, except that they had, had a number of incidents where they had patrolling Japanese uh, soldiers and, and what have you that almost, almost uh, uh, interrupted the plan. They even had a train come by before they were ready for the train, the, the explosion to go, and that, they, the engineer of the train supposedly was looking down on the track and they thought that they'd been exposed that way. Anyway, it didn't happen and they finally got it set and they got back to their rubber boats and were about halfway back to the submarine when the explosion took place. And, and it, what they said, it was a wonderful sight to see all of the splashing and everything else like that and the cars crashing in. And, but the captain was on the bridge hollering at them, bro, like you're like, like crazy, man, we got to get out of here. And they, they finally got on board, turned high speed and escaped and, and, and got away at, uh, as a result of uh, lots of shooting at them and everything else like that, but they managed to do it. And uh, later on, uh, uh, just the, uh, the, in an interview, uh, the Plucky, who was, a, a, not Plucky, but a later in, in our time frame. A commander of the SEALs was asked why SEALs team were eight in size, not some other number, six or ten. And his reply was, well, the first raid by the Barb in the Second World War was eight, and that worked out just fine, so we've kept that number since then. So I thought that was a very logical solution, right? So anyway, the, uh, uh, the last command, my connection was, my last commanding officer was a guy named uh, uh, Max Duncan. We called him Commodore because he was a squadron commander. And uh, and and he uh, he was a member of that crew, although he, he, he was not on the uh, not on the uh, actual uh, uh, group that went to swim ashore. Saunders, the chief of the boat, was awarded the Navy Cross for his action in that thing, and the skipper of the Barb was awarded the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross with three gold stars for this particular raid and many others that he had while he was on the Barb. It included sinking an aircraft carrier, a cruiser, a, a, a frigate, and various other merchant vessels, as well as rescuing some Australian and Brit British prisoners who were adrift in the South China Sea in what amounted to a, a typhoon. So it was a very hazardous thing, but they did capture those, collect those 14 people who were essentially starving to death at sea. Okay, anyway. So Rear Admiral, the guy, the captain who later became a Rear Admiral, uh, his name was Flucky. And he was called Lucky. You know, I guess 
it for obvious reasons for the name, but also because of the great uh, success that he had had in some really close call uh, uh, wartime experiences as while he was commanding officer of the of the barb the barb had the highest i'll call it production of uh, uh, sinking of ships and destroying shore-based uh, activities with gunfire and stuff like that of any other submarine there were other submarines that had higher tonnage of sinking overall but no no single captain had as much as that but now to turn to some submarine stories I've, that are mine this photo that you see here is this uh, harder ss568 and if you can see the cursor you can see where I'm circling, where that's the, the bridge where we rode on, on the surface. And that's about 17 feet above the water line. And I can remember standing watch in the North Atlantic. Fortunately, it was in the Gulf Stream and the water was warmish. And we had green water, not spray coming over the bridge. We had green water coming over the top of the, what we call it, the cockpit and filling the cockpit up. Uh, and we were strapped in like that, but fortunately, Pretty soon after that, the captain decided that was bad enough. He let us come down and we did a periscope watch, even though we were on the surface. But the, the Herder was the last ship of a class of submarines called the Tang class, and they were built post-World post War II, and they were based on the what was considered the very advanced submarine design called the German Type 21 submarine. The Nautilus, of our first nuclear submarine, was also of that design, but it was being constructed as, I didn't, don't even remember the name of it, it wasn't Nautilus, but, uh, and, and they cut it in half and added a big section in the middle of it so that it was uh, big enough so they could add room for the nuclear power plant that went into the, the Nautilus. Anyway, there had been no casualty or recovery trials uh, for this class of submarines, and so, so we had the, the uh, I guess, the good fortune of it, as it turns out, uh, to be elected to, undergo this uh, uh, re casualty recovery trials and also the depth charge sustainability trials. In the recovery trials, a, a submerged submarine would in intentionally not use one or more of the tools that we use for controlling depth, either the bow planes located, in our case, on the very front of the ship, and, and the uh, stern planes located at, at, at the uh, back behind by the props. And uh, then you could use, uh, we actually had, you could use water, the uh, uh, tanks of water or, or ballast tanks to blow water out of it, and other means to also help to control an, uh, a, a, a dive that was going to be deeper than you wanted to. But So what you need to understand is that a submarine, our submarine, was 265 feet long, and we operate in a thin strip of water from the surface to normally about 400 feet. That's what we were was our official public operating depth at that time. So this is a little math quiz for everybody. You do the math with a 30 degree down angle or bubble as we called it, and you're traveling at 10 knots submerged and that's about 60,000 feet an hour or a thousand feet a minute. And it doesn't take long to cover 400 feet of depth when the down angle is 15, uh, 30 degrees, which means that for every foot forward, you go down one foot, so you travel a thousand feet in a minute, you've also traveled downward 500 feet or upwards if you're going to that other direction, okay. So quick response to casualties uh, and the right combination of control of, the, of the, the bow planes or the stern planes are very importantly being able to use the motors or the electric motors that the submarine used to back to back and slow any descent or, and, and uh, with the stern planes are operating, then the bow plane, uh, the uh, boaters are very, very effective. You can really turn the ship straight anyway. We went through a lot of those and, uh, and uh, some of them were pretty uh, harrowing because you just couldn't seem to ever get the thing turned around and we'd get closer and closer and closer to the depth of which we were restricted from. And, and uh, anyway, none of them were bad enough that the captain I decided that we should uh, abandon it because of, uh, of safety atoms. However, when you get to the depth charge, the safe, you, they're, they're gonna drop explosions on it. They need to know where we are. So we used what was a barrage balloon, which is a holdover from World War uh, II. And they had a, a, a long cable to it and they anchored it to the back of our submarine. And it was up in the air, about two or 300 feet in the air. And then we could, dive down to several hundred feet of depth and and the 
barrage balloon would still be visible so that the destroyers could track us and keep that track where we really were. They then proceeded to drop depth charges on us or near us, I, I think was their word for, for, for it. And they, they weren't ever really very close. They, you know, they were, oh, I can't remember the yardage, but I, I, I think it was like maybe a hundred yards was as close as they ever got, you know. But in any case, they had strain meters across the ship of wires with the uh, strain meters on them, and and uh, and I was naive and not didn't know worry much about it. What what have you at that time? But when those strain meters started reacting, I started thinking, oh crap, this could be serious. Okay, anyway, we uh, the captain eventually called it off because we were starting to get things get knocked off the wall uh, uh, in the submarine. Uh, the, no damage to the submarine hull or anything occurred, but they did. They did deem that they had got enough information to do some calculations for us. So, so I can't with my little experience with that, with them being a hundred yards away, I can't imagine what those sailors on the barb and others felt when they sometimes went underwater uh, step charging for seven hours or more. And if you remember some of the World War II movies, you see used to see them cut them down and falling, hitting on the deck and rolling off, and all this kind of stuff. So they were really close. Anyway. Enough of this old diesel boat stuff. Let's now go get some real exciting stuff uh, brought on by the nuclear, nuclear power and the submarine's design for maximum performance uh, underwater and not on the surface. So Captain Bob Davis, alias Lieutenant JG, for some of these stories. Thank you, Ellie. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in the 1980s, uh, one more World War II story, I had the honor to meet Admiral William L. Anderson, United States Navy, retired, Naval Academy class of 1926. In the 1950s, uh, Ben Captain Anderson had been the commanding officer of the Naval ROTC unit at the University of South Carolina as professor of Naval Science. And I too am a graduate of the ROTC program at South Carolina. Uh, I then learned, though, that Commander that uh, Admiral Anderson in World War II had been Commander Anderson and had command of the USS Thresher, SS-200. And the uh, Thresher, according to Wikipedia, was the most highly decorated submarine in World War II. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The Thresher that day was returning from a patrol to the Western Pacific and attempting to enter Pearl Harbor. Admiral Anderson said that after the Japanese attack, our guys were shooting at anything and everything that moved there was even a potential threat. The Thresher, he said, had several close calls being shot at by our own guys, but they made it into Pearl. Three months later, March 1942, Admiral Anderson gets told to go see Admiral Nimitz. Admiral Nimitz, the commander in chief of the Pacific Fleet, has a job for the Thresher. He, uh, he, uh, Admiral Nimitz gives him an envelope and tells him to sail to Midway Island, refuel, and then open the envelope. The envelope has orders for him to proceed to a map coordinate. At that map coordinate, He's to send weather reports on a certain frequency at certain intervals. The map coordinate was in the middle of Tokyo Bay. Admiral Anderson said it didn't take a real genius to figure out that he was sending weather reports to a carrier task force. And of course, it was the two little raiders aboard the Hornet. And uh, he said that after the two little raid, and remember the Doolittle Raiders bombed Tokyo, Kyoto, and several other cities. After the raid, he said in our submarine parlance, it was up scope for a look around. And there in the middle of Tokyo Bay was a heavily uh, loaded, beautiful Japanese freighter sitting there. And he said he made the only perfect war shot of the entire war he made that day. Split that freighter in half and sent it to the bottom. He did say that, unfortunately, the Japanese were rather angry and came after him. He said they were depth charged for seven plus hours. He said about the fourth hour, the tension was really getting to the guys, 
And he said it was time for somebody to say something. And the ensign, the junior officer on board, spoke up and said, if anybody thinks I'm scared, they're crazy as hell. But I sure am homesick right now. The Thresher made it out of Tokyo Bay, made it back to Pearl Harbor, in spite of a ruptured ballast tank from the death charge, and Admiral Anderson received the Navy Cross, the second highest award our country can bestow. And I'll tell you this, as we're all Rotarians, when Admiral Anderson spoke to our club, I want you to know there's a tradition in our club, we always, and I do mean always, give a standing ovation to our district governor when he or she visits. That day, when he spoke, our club, and our club's a bit stingy on standing ovations, otherwise gave an incredible ovation to Admiral Anderson. That was a very special moment. My service aboard nuclear submarine so in February 1973, I reported aboard USS Sunfish, SSN 649. You see the nine white stars on the plaque? That represents the nine submarine war patrols from World War II. The World War, Sun, World War II Sunfish had an incredible record. But again, 630, 649 was nuclear powered, was built in 1965. For you uh, techie types out there, uh, Sunfish was a 637 class submarine. In the 1970s, uh, 637s were 300 feet long. They had a beam of 32 feet, 4,600 tons submerged, a crew of 12 officers, 107 enlisted sailors. We had two periscopes. We had a snorkel mast, an electronic surveillance mast, a radar mast, a radio direction finder, a UHF mast, and there were four torpedo tubes amidships on our boat. And our weapons were the Mark 37, the Mark 45, which was a nuclear torpedo, the Mark 48 torpedo, and the UUM sub-44 sub rock, which was nuclear capable. As to speed and depth, all we were ever allowed to say was that we can go uh, faster than 20 knots and we can go deeper than 400 feet. 400 feet, again, was the test depth for World War II diesel submarines. If you look it up on Wikipedia today, you'll see that the submerged speed for a 637 class a Wikipedia is 26 knots, and we could do a little better than that. And the depth, chest depth for the boat on Wikipedia is 1,320 feet. Now again, then outside of that, you have a wartime operating depth limit, and you have an estimated crush depth. The, uh, when I reported aboard, we were in overhaul at Portsmouth, Virginia. After overhaul, we took the boat back out for sea trials, and one of the first trials, as Ellie mentioned, was we tied a, tied a taut string from one bulkhead to the other. Then as we dove deeper and deeper and deeper, we measured how far the string sang. And even as a 22-year-old kid, I fully understood the perils and the pressures we were facing as that ship dove. We opened and closed watertight doors. We operated every piece of operating equipment we had to see how it worked in that environment. And uh, one comforting thought, on board during that test F dive were the key shipyard workers from the shipyard who had done the work of the overhaul. Seeing those guys gave me a certain degree of comfort. In June of 74, Sunfish deployed to the Mediterranean Sea for a six-month deployment. Uh, the first story I'll mention was that we were trailing a Russian submarine. The Russians had lousy passive sonars, but they had an incredible active sonar. We called it blocks of wood because that's what it sounded like. It sounded like two two-by-fours being banged together. Why were we trailing the Russian submarine? Well, I wanted to know where it was. But number two, we were attempting to get what we referred to as a sound 
signature profile. We were coded in the ways the Russian submarine made as it changed depth, as it operated at various speeds, as it operated certain equipment on board. We would take that recording when we get back to the States, they would feed it into a Cray-1 computer in Virginia. And the reason they did that was so that a few months later, when that Russian submarine sailed by hydrophones, we had placed throughout the Atlantic, the Mediterranean, Caribbean, we'd know that submarine was there. And we would know what he was doing. So again, that was the reason we were trailing. We had been trailing that submarine for a few days when all of a sudden the Russian did what is, never, you never know when they're gonna do it. They went active with their sonar, blocks of wood. I didn't hear it through the hydrophone, I heard it through the hull. It tells me we were probably way too close. But anyway, the captain, the old man, spread it into the control room. And by the way, the captain is the old man. He was 35 years old. I was 22 years old. He was an old man. I still recall that clearly. But the old man ordered me to take the ship down to test death and to ring up a flank bell to get away from the Russian. As I executed the order, I reached over and pulled a book off the shelf, the ship's diving book. I opened the ship's diving book to a page that showed the ship's recoverability curve. The recoverability curve gave us our chances of making it back to the surface at a certain depth and a certain speed. Test depth and a flight bell were not on that curve. I handed the book to the captain. The captain looked at it, said, thank you, Lieutenant. He closed the book. He put it back on the shelf. He did not change his order. I'm here to tell you the story. It worked. Another time we were trailing the Russian destroyer and the captain decided we would do an underwater hull surveillance. We attached the destroyer. The captain ordered me to keep the depth at six two feet plus or minus two inches. Now let me tell you something. A 300 foot long submarine with 4,600 ton displacement, keeping it plus or minus a foot is a challenge. Keeping it plus or minus a couple of inches, that's another story. But let me tell you, I sweated that one, but we got our photos. Finally, we finished the deployment. We made it back to the States. And in June of 1975, we were ordered to conduct an operational test firing of a brand new torpedo, the Mark 45, the Mark 48, I'm sorry. It could outrun anything on the surface. We sailed to Norfolk, Virginia, and they pulled an old mothball destroyer for the ex-USS Moore out of the James River. We put a torpedo into the water. It sailed under the moor and did not explode. We put a second fish in the water. It sailed under the moor. It too did not explode. Then the two submarines honed in on each other and exploded. We sailed back into Charleston. On the pier waiting for us was a team from the Bureau of Naval Ordnance headed by an admiral. They wanted to see what we had done wrong, why that test had failed. A month and a half later, they came back and told us that there had been a flaw in the design. They sent us back to Norfolk with the corrected torpedo, and we sank the moor with one shot. Ladies and gentlemen, those were exciting times. They certainly weren't boring. And Ellie and I are very proud to have served. That's probably enough stories from a couple of old sailors. Uh, Ellie and I will be happy to answer any questions we've got. And uh, Donald, we would like to close with one note uh, if there are no questions. Uh, well, this is great information. I, I honestly wish we could have you for longer time, but uh, great information. Uh, I only see one 
question in the chat box right now. So those of you on here, now's your chance. If you have a question, we'll, we'll take a few here. Uh, but we do need to start wrapping this program up. Uh, is what really happened to the scorpion? Bob, you want to take that? That's a great story. And let me just say that the, the commonly accepted and believed version is that there was a torpedo malfunction. They had to jettison the torpedo, and that the, tor the torpedo owned on the scorpion. Uh, that, that is still to a, a degree of speculation, though. Uh, the, what may have actually happened uh, is still classified, but that's the widely considered story. Ellie, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, no, I, I, I had heard a similar thing about that, 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 the, that, the, that the torpedo was actually in the, torp in the ship, not prepared to be launched whenever it came alive and started running. And when that happens, the torpedo has, it has a counter of how many times the prop turns. And after so many turns, it becomes armed. And so that could blow up in the tube, but you can disable it. It has a safety mechanism in it that if it turns, you know, 360 degrees to the right or something, like whatever it is, that the, the torpedo will disable itself so that it wouldn't circle back and hit the ship. And so one of the possibilities other than what Bob said there is that they were trying to make the turn to shut the torpedo down by its safety factor, and it, it didn't, that didn't, well, whatever it is. That, that's the best story I've heard. The torpedo function one way or the other is the one I've, I've heard most likely was the cause. Okay. And we do know what happened with the thresher, the nuclear power thresher. She was on a test death dive, just like I went on, and she had a flooding casualty. And the, the, that tragedy did lead to a system we call subsafe, which is where they highly uh, increased the reliability of submarine piping, valves, operating systems uh, to a huge degree. And uh, I think it saved my life, and I appreciate that. But we uh, we lost the threshold. All right, just a couple closing comments. Uh, T.J. Egan put in the chat that General Jimmy Doolittle was my wife's great uncle. And then also, uh, his yeah. grandpa built submarines in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, during World War II. Uh, he was a carpenter and foreman right. for a crew who <laughs> built a life-size wooden sub in Manitowoc. Don't see any other uh, questions in the chat box, so I do want to say thank you guys for your service. Thank you for a very informative presentation today. Um, I do really appreciate it. Um, did you have anything to close out before I go to final announcements as we wrap up today? Donald, on your screen, you can see the submarine verse from the Navy hymn, Lord God, our power evermore, whose arm doth reach the ocean floor, died with our men beneath the sea, traverse the depths protectively. Oh, hear us when we pray and keep them safe from peril in the deep. And I'd like to say that right now, there are young sailors out there manning those boats to see right now. And it's not, it's young men and young women today manning those boats. That's all I have. Yep, that's it. We enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun trying to dig in and, 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 and find this information out. Thank you all for asking us. Okay. We're, we're glad to have you again, and thank you very much. A couple closing announcements as we wind down uh, CRAP. Uh, they're on here. I want to say thank you to uh, past District Governor Sandy Brooks for doing a Facebook Live of Bernie's Final Mile on our district Facebook page. If you did not see that yet, you can go over to the District 7770 Facebook page and see that. And also want to say thank you to uh, David and Susan Terrard. I believe they have a video of that. We're going to play that on the Wednesday C-Wrap coming up on Wednesday this week. So thank you guys for doing that. And then also want to congratulate Bernie. Uh, Bernie Rydell, our district polio chair. Uh, I believe he ran 500 miles for polio and raised over $15,000. So great job, Bernie.
hopefully uh, we'll see Bernie on an upcoming C-Rap and we can personally congratulate him at that point. So as we say, run Bernie run and run Bernie run did go all the way. So congratulations again, Bernie. Coming up this week for C-Rap, because we're back to three days a week now, folks. The break is over. On Wednesday, Alice Alt with the U.S. Marshals Museum Foundation, the past and present of the U.S. Marshals Service, the national's oldest and most prolific federal law enforcement agency. And then up on Friday is uh, Colonel Barry Wingard from the Florence Veterans Park. Uh, they do statues to veterans that you might not know about. So, and I believe Barry is a fellow Rotarian as well in our district. So look forward to seeing you there. Wednesdays at noon, Friday is at 11 o'clock. I will end with the rotary four-way test. Of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Hope everyone has a wonderful Monday, we'll see you on Wednesday for the next conversation with Rotary Action people. Take care, folks. That's a wrap. Ellie and Bob, that was great.